Well, warm welcome to today's talk. Now, the term game changer is probably a bit strong, but this video actually is a game changer. It's the first officially approved antiviral. Now, we've got a lot more to say on antivirals and the background to this, but I just want to focus on the information that we have so far. Now, this is on this new medication here, the Merck new medication called Molnupiravir. Now, let's um, just look at where we get this information from. Now, I don't like science by press release. We need science by peer-reviewed literature, but we, this, we haven't got it yet. We will soon, but we haven't got it yet. So we've got this, basically, this press release from Merck and Ridgeback. Investigational oral antiviral Molnupiravir. And uh, great claims are made for it. And these do seem to be substantiated. Now, we have to stress this is not substantiated by peer review yet, but a company like Merck wouldn't release this until they were fairly sure about what they were talking about. So let's look at what they're saying. So this is Merck in combination with a, a group, another group called Ridgeback who brought this out. Now, this is an oral antiviral. Now, of course, we have the monoclonal antibody therapies that are used at the moment. But the, the, these can be given uh, shortly after diagnosis in the first week of the illness, preferably, preferably in the first day or two of the illness, in the viral stage, before the inflammatory problems have arisen, why it's still the virus that's the primary pathology. But they have to be given in hospital, they're expensive, they have to be given intravenously. Whereas this is potentially a very simple, straightforward oral preparation. So it's the first oral properly recognised antiviral. Now, this is huge. I mean, having worked in healthcare for, for uh, 40 years, we've always dreamed about an antiviral. Now, some antivirals did come out for herpes simplex virus, like for cold sores, the acyclovir. And then some antivirals came out for uh, against retroviruses, the, the highly active antiretroviral therapy for HIV. But apart from that, we really don't have much in the way of antiviral therapy. So this is a big, this is a big step that this is now officially uh, being officially recognised. Um, so it's an oral um, antiviral. Molnupiravir, this is the code name for it. The, uh, no one really, I don't know what these stand for. They're, they're just code names given by the pharmaceutical developers. Now there's a positive interim analysis of a phase three study. So what they've done here is, um, rather than let the study run for the whole duration, they were convinced by the results and they've actually terminated the study because the idea here is that if something is very effective, it would be unethical to carry on giving people a placebo, which, which I, I agree with. That makes sense. Now, they're saying significantly reduced risk of hospitalizations or deaths. Of course, we welcome both during day one to five to twenty nine. Now, what I mean by this is people were recruited and they were allowed to start the treatment if they were the first, second, third, fourth or fifth day after they developed symptoms. So in other words, this was in the viral phase of the illness. It'd be no good giving this in the second week because it's an antiviral. It's got to be given early to reduce the viral load, to reduce the likelihood of the inflammatory complications that can cause death in this and severe illness and death in this condition. And then they followed the patients through for 29 days, which seems pretty reasonable. So it's called the move out trial phase through. Three. Now, they took at-risk non-hospitalised adults with mild to moderate COVID-19. This is who they recruited. So it's a global phase three randomised placebo-controlled double-blind multi-centre study. Excellent. That's the ideal clinical trial. And I strongly suspect that when we get the peer-reviewed literature on this, this trial will have been impeccably carried out because there's a big pharmaceutical companies involved and there's a lot of money at stake and they will want to get it Right. So it's non-hospitalised patients to prevent people getting hospitalised. And it was carried out basically all over the place, all those countries. So multi-centre international study. This is um, research really at its, at its best as they can coordinate. Eligibility criteria for the study. Who was allowed to get into it? Laboratory confirmed mild to moderate 19, of course, all completely confirmed cases. Symptoms onset within five days of study randomization, so the first five days of the illness in the viral phase. And all patients were required to have at least one risk factor. So one risk factor such as uh, age, uh, hypertension, obesity, heart disease, lung disease, immunocompromised, something that would make them more at risk, <clears throat> more at risk of being hospitalized.
And the results are pretty good, basically a 50% improvement. This is the Mulpiravir group. Hospitalised or dead, 7.3% of the patients. Remember, these are patients with at least one risk factor. In other words, hospitalised or died, 28 out of 385 patients. No deaths in this group. Very good. Treated with Mulpiravir. Mulnorpiravir. You can tell antivirals, they got Vir on the end. Um, placebo group, completely randomised, of course. So this is this is good stuff. Hospitalizations or dead, 14.1%. Getting on for double. That was 53 out of 377 patients. And the probability that that result arose by chance is P equals 0 0.0012. In other words, there's only uh, a very, very small, very, very small chance. This is the highly significant result. That wouldn't arise by chance. And um, placebo group, well, there was eight deaths in the placebo group. So pretty pretty convincing, actually. About a 50% reduction in hospitalisation and, and perhaps even more significant reduction in deaths as long as it was given in the first week of the illness. Uh, data monitoring committee on consultation with the FDA in the United States. Recruitment to the study stopped early, which is good because it was working so well. Due to these positive results... Uh, Merck have applied for emergency use authorization in the United States and all around the world, including the British authorities and the European Medicines Agency. Uh, and they are in consultation with many governments around the world uh, and um, are in consultation with governments that they haven't yet made agreements with. So this is going to be a huge international rollout. Um, I'm pretty sure the approval is going to be given within a few weeks and people will be taking this drug within a month. So this is, this is happening pretty soon. FDA dependent, of course. But of course, will the European Medicines Agency or the British Regulatory Authorities act first? That, that's still possible because they've, um, they've been uh, recruited into this as well. Now, they evaluated data on 775 patients, which is a reasonable sample size. Now, they were planning to recruit 1,550 and they recruited 90% of that already when they paused it. Molnopuravir reduced risk of hospitalizations and death across all key subgroups, which is important. So different people with different risk factors, whether it was obesity, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease, renal disease, whatever it was, it was still effective at reducing hospitalizations, which is encouraging. Efficacy was not affected by the timing of symptoms or the underlying risk factor. So it looks like it was working any time in the first five days. Now, we're not sure about that, of course, because um, this is only this is all the information we have. The information we have here is pretty limited. As I say, it's basically a press release. And I've just tried to get as much out of that uh, and make as much sense of that as possible. About 40 percent of patients had sequencing data to show them what variant of the virus they have. And Molnopuravir demonstrated consistent efficacy across viral variants, gamma, delta, and mu. And of course, the mu is the one that might be somewhat vaccine resistant. The delta one is the one that we know, of course, is everywhere. So looking like the antiviral spectrum of properties is good across all of the variants equally. And that does make sense when we look at the way that this drug is working. Um, incidence of adverse events between groups. Now, this is going to be critical. How safe is this drug going to be? Now, there was very limited data on this, but I think we can assume the FDA and the regulatory authorities have been given full information. And from what we hear, it's going to be a reasonably safe drug. But let's look at what we uh, know from the press release. Incidence of adverse events in the Mulpovia group, 35%. The incidence of adverse events in the placebo, a group, uh, 40%. So not significant difference between the two groups. You can see why it's so important to have two groups. Drug-related adverse events in the Molpuravir group, 12%. 11% in the placebo group. In other words, these weren't, weren't real. It was generated by the essentially by the mind of the individual. So um, basically, again, not statistically significantly different. Subjects who discontinued the study therapy due to an adverse event, well, in the Mulpuravir group, 1.3% felt they had to discontinue taking the medication. In the placebo group, 3.4% felt they had to discontinue uh, taking the uh, medication. Merck said data shows Mulpuravir is not uh, 
capable of inducing genetic change in human cells. Now, this is not from the press release. But the concern, the concern is, and I'm not too concerned about it myself, but it's looking like it's going to be OK. But the way this drug works is it interferes with the, um, the RNA replication of the virus. And the, some people are concerned that it could interfere with the viral replication or with the DNA replication, rather, in, in human cells. But Merck here has said, and this is actually in what they said to Reuters rather than this press release, as Merck, Merck said data shows monopuravir is not capable of inducing genetic change in human cells. So it messes up the genetics of the viral cell, kills the viral cell, but not the human cells. So in other words, is this a silver bullet? Does it only kill the virus? It's looking that way. But men enrolled in trials had to abstain from uh, intercourse or agree to use contraception. They didn't want people's sperm fertilising um, ovum when they were on this medication. Uh, no reason for that given, but this is just what we are. This is just what we know so far. Reuters report said women of childbearing age in the study could be pregnant, also had to use birth control. Now that's what they said. So I put the not in there because I think they've just missed it out. So uh, basically, they don't want to give this to pregnant women. And this is not necessarily a warning sign. It, this is just reasonable caution. Until more data is gathered, um, we, we can keep this out of the reproductive processes until more information is gathered. Um, about Merck's effort to enable access to normal to appear of it if it's granted emergency use, use authorization or approval, which I'm expecting it will be fairly soon. Merck has been producing monoperivir at risk. In other words, they're making a, a shed load of it, but if it's not given approval, they'll lose the money. Um, Merck expects to produce 10 million courses of treatment by the end of 2021. 10 million courses, which should be a good start. Um, existing procurement agreement with the United States government, they have. And the agreement is Merck will supply approximately 1.7 million courses of monoperivir to the US government upon EAU approval. Now, as I said, there's more background to talk about this now. But in this video, we're just talking about what we know from the press releases and other press sources, which is all we have at the moment. And as I've said, that is encouraging. Now, what they didn't seem to have space for in the press release was the cost. Um, $700 for a five day course, we believe. I think it works out at about $705. It's two doses a day, so I guess that's working out about $70 a, a capsule. And that's based on 1.2 billion purchasing agreement from the United States government for 1.7 million, uh, million treatment courses of monoperivir. So a, a course is 10 capsules, uh, BD, two capsules a day for five days. And that's going to cost $700 a course. This is huge, huge potential income, clearly. Other antiretrovirals are, uh, other, no, sorry, other, other retroviral, antiretrovirals we have. This is an antiviral. Uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is not a retroviral. I misspoke there. So other, uh, other antivirals are on their way from Pfizer and other companies. So this is just the first to be officially recognised. So, um, but not cheap. Merck, uh, but news may be getting better. Merck supply and purchase agreement with other governments worldwide. That's happening. They're also negotiating with other governments at the moment. People are going to be queuing up for this stuff, I, I would imagine, fairly soon. Plans to implement a tiered pricing approach based on World Bank country income criteria. So it's going to be cheaper for poorer countries, which is good. Company has entered into non-exclusive voluntary licensing agreement for monoperavir with established drug manufacturers, uh, particularly in India. Generic manufacturers to accelerate availability of monoperavir in more than 100 lower middle income countries. So let's hope they um, come good on this boast. Um, but that's what they're saying so far. Also on this study, the most common risk factors um, for poor disease outcome included obesity. So these were kind of side effects, really. But people with obesity didn't do so well in either category. Older age didn't do so well. Diabetes mellitus didn't do so well. And heart disease didn't do so well. So nothing really new there. But it is interesting to sort of carry on with that data. Um, and any extra evidence is always useful. Now, this is um, about Molnor Puravir now. Um, so it's investigational, it's being investigated, orally administered, not IV, the same as the monoclonal antibodies. 
and it's a form of uh, ribonucleoside analog. So the ribo is the sugar part. The, the, this, these are the, the nucleic bases that make up the RNA. So basically what this does is it pretends to be one of these bases with its sugar. Uh, but it, it but it actually um, inhibits the replication of SARS coronavirus to ribonucleic acid. So it's a bit it's a bit like a sort of as far as I know I do, we don't know a lot yet but it seems to be a bit like a sort of a, a Trojan horse. It's like one of these ribonucleosides, but it actually isn't. It actually goofs up, messes up, interferes with the whole process. Like so I guess I will call it a, an antagonistic effect. So it inhibits the replication of SARS coronavirus too. That's the way it works. Several preclinical models of SARS coronavirus 2 and include, so this looks like it could be effective for prophylaxis, preventing the infection, early treatment of the infection, and also reducing transmission. So it looks like it could have activity in those three areas. They're also conducting another study called Move Ahead, which is a global multicenter randomized or blind control placebo controlled phase three study. <laughs> Good. And that's evaluating the efficacy and safety of molnopiravir in preventing the spread of COVID-19 within households. Well, that was the bit uh, that I found about the, uh, the cost of this, uh, the cost of the medication, the Biden administration announcement. It's actually, uh, it's actually in there. Uh, obviously, I put the link there, but uh, here we are. Um, on the 1.2 billion purchase agreement for the 1.7 million five-day treatment courses of Molnopiravir. So uh, not not remotely cheap, but it's, uh, it's the first one. So there we go. Um, now, as I say, more, more critique of that at the moment. That's just a quick review of what we know. We've been waiting for antivirals for a long time. Antivirals are potentially a complete game changer because the the allergy I like to use is, is bubonic uh, plague. You know, the bubonic, the, the Black Death that first came to England in 1348. And there's been outbreaks. The plague of Justinian back in classical times was, was, um, was, was, was um, the, the same bacteria, Yersinia pestis, that causes the, the Black Death. And there's been outbreaks. The, there was a big one in my country again in 1665 just before the Great Fire of London in 1666. And anyway, so th there's been outbreaks of this all the time, and there's outbreaks as well every year in India, China, quite a few places in the world, but it's not a problem because we treat it with antibiotics. It's eminently treatable. That cures the patients as long as we catch them early enough. They're nearly always cured. If, if they become septic already, then they're probably going to die. But as long as we catch it early enough, we treat these patients. But because we treat the patients, we kill the bugs. Therefore, the bugs don't spread. So an antiviral really could be the, um, an effective antiviral could really be the holy grail that if properly implemented and distributed um, could halt this pandemic really quite quickly. And of course, uh, shares in companies making antivirals have gone up and uh, shares in some vaccine producers have gone down because... If you've got brilliant antivirals, uh, you might need less vaccines. Now, at the moment, of course, we're encouraging the vaccination programme. This is going to be a useful additional weapon in the arsenal, reducing hospitalisations by getting on for 50 percent, which is good news as we await further data. Now, as I say, more on antivirals later. But that's that's the news on that one for now. So uh, thank you for watching. And antivirals are coming and they will be massively significant not only for this but imagine we had a, gene a generic antiviral that was really effective against all rna viruses then another rna pandemic came up we, we could clobber it at source and the pandemic would never arise and people are working very hard to uh, recognize drugs that might be effective as antivirals and develop new antivirals as we speak so this is promising and I'm hoping, as we've said, this is going to be implemented within the next few weeks. So thanks for watching this video and stay tuned for uh, more comments on this and other antivirals shortly.